So, yeah, so we have, um, we're going to start with a video. This was filmed in Ireland. Um, there was a, um, we, we have two burials of Duffy's Cut victims in Ireland. Uh, this is from the town of Clano in County Tyrone. Um, and um, it's, it's really self-explanatory, but it was filmed by a man who was working on his master's thesis in communications and, and, and video studies and so on. And um, we didn't even know he was there. Um, until halfway through the trip. And then when we saw the video that he produced, we realized he was there when we landed in Dublin. And every step of the journey was like, oh my gosh, we, we've been stalked. But it was, it was cool. It's a very neat result. So I guess we'll start with, with, the, uh, with the video. And it, it is self-explanatory. I'll tell you one thing, Kevin, it's uh, that's a fair day, but lovely day. Six plus one makes seven, dear people. And in the history of the church, there are six plus one corporal, bodily works of mercy. The first six come from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, the great last judgment story, when Jesus said, that the king in the story identifies himself with the poorest of the poor. And he says, in so far as you did this to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a stranger, you made me welcome. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to see me. That's the six. And for the first 300 years and more of the church, that was the six corporal works of mercy. But in the fourth century, the church, reflecting on an incident in the book of Tobit in the Old Testament, they added another. A better number, the seventh corporal work of mercy, to bury the dead. And today, dear people, thanks to our American visitors, it is our privilege to practice the seventh corporal work of mercy, to bury the dead. And that surely is an awesome privilege for all to own people today. For Catherine is one of our own. She's no stranger. She took the boat to the USA for no other reason than she had no choice. She could stay at home, starve, or she could gamble on taking the ship across the Atlantic and with a bit of luck, catch the tail of the American dream. But if she hoped to escape the purgatory of her life in Ireland, as Christy Moore's song, Duffy's Cut, says so well, she was sailing into hell. And less than two months after her arrival in the New World, she and her 56 Irish companions at Duffy's Cut were all dead and buried in an unmarked grave. And worse still, no one that mattered thought the 57 mattered. And like their bodies, the story of their death was covered up 
for over, for almost 200 years. But, dear people, there's a goodness in the hearts of men and women. And today, as a Tyrone man myself, and on behalf of all Tyrone men and women, I thank the people of Duffy's Cut Project for the courtesy and respect they have shown our Tyrone Catherine. Coramilama Ogov, August Banak J. Orov Galair. A thousand thanks and God's blessing on you all. And we praise God that you were kind enough and able enough to do it. Thank you so much indeed. Grant on to Catherine, O Lord, and a perpetual light shine upon her. Amen. To you, O Lord, we commend the soul of Catherine, your servant. In the sight of this world, she is now dead. In your sight, may she live forever. One guy was out of tune. All right, um, get out of and share that. Hey, music! It says uh, we're trying. Actually, no. We piped her to her to her burial spot. You were one of the pipers. Yes, we we all piped. Yeah, my brother and I. Yeah, we we've been we've been piping. I've been piping forty three years. I think my brother's been piping forty two years. Um, and between the one of the other pipers, there we've been piping over one hundred and twenty, almost one hundred and thirty years between us. So it's kind of crazy. But it was you know it's one of those things. We, we we piped in 2013 for the first burial we did over there and then in 2015 we had we actually were all dressed alike so it was kind of cool um but you, you know normally when we do this presentation we have to explain to people what a, a railroad cut and a railroad fill are and we don't have to do that tonight which is which is wonderful but um you know it's this was a site that um was really um put into folklore in many ways in the local community because of the um, the ghost stories that have been connected with the site. Um, and also because of the fact that Philip Duffy, the man, the contractor from Ireland, who, who was the, uh, the one who, who uh, was contracted to build this, this mile of railroad. Um, he was a strange character. We were told when we started this, we probably wouldn't find out anything uh, of substance on Philip Duffy. But by the time we finished, we found, his birth in Ireland, his death certificate in the city of Philadelphia, most of his contracts uh, for the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad, as well as the Pennsylvania Railroad later on, as well as uh, municipal contracts for the city of Philadelphia. And so what's what's fascinating is we, we, we took a story that was folklore, the ghost stories and so on. We first heard this story from our, um, our grandfather worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, he was... Um, personal assistant to a number of presidents, including Martin Clement, and um, and then also um, became director of personnel management for the railroad. So he had taken us for walks along the tracks when we were kids and told us all sorts of stories. And one of those ones that he told us that I remember very distinctly was the story of Duffy's yeah. Cut. And so um, we said, you know, let's take this in 2002. We said, let's take this story and try to find out what we can about it. And so um, this this record here is in the National Archives. This is um, the official account of what happened at Duffy's Cut in the PNC records. Uh, William Mitchell uh, was born in Northern Ireland, um, and um, he... Um, Shortly after what happened at Duffy's Cut, he ends up going west, working in Ohio, ends up in politics in that state, becomes a senator, I believe it was. Very interesting character. But he was he was Duffy's immediate supervisor. And he tried to explain to James Clark of the Pennsylvania, uh, you know, the, the, um, the Canal Commission, what was going on and why the delay was there. So this letter was very significant. And um, he tries to explain what happened, that... Um, uh, that Duffy claims he's uh, behind his his uh, his work because of um, uh, the fact that half of his men died of cholera. That's what this says here. And uh, let me let me do the. <laughs> 
we're in the modern world here. So this is pretty cool. Um, so, so this is his contract. This was found in the Pennsylvania State Archives as, as an archivist in New Jersey for the Lutheran Church. You know, I, 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 I focus on paper. You know, we focus on paper in the archives. And these were two amazing things that we found. The record of what happened there in Duffy's official contract. And my brother and I um, and our colleagues, you know, we took multiple trips to the state archives. And we said, you know, what's going on in the state record? And we found a whole slew of things that were of significance here. We also went to the county archives and we found um, records in the local newspaper of Philip Duffy's work. Um, Duffy was born in 1783 in Ireland. He ended up coming over in the year of the, of the United Irishmen Rebellion, the Wolf Tone Rebellion, um, uh, 1798. And what happened was he ended up um, working from, uh, there we go. Yep, there we go. Working uh, his way up as a teenage boy to becoming a contractor. He worked with his brother-in-law, James Smith, along a mile of railroad before he was given the contract, which is found in, this is found in the, the Pennsylvania State Archives, very significant. There's his signature. Um, and then this is, this also is a record of his naturalization. He, he left Ireland in 17. 98, the year of the United Irishmen's Rebellion, unrest in his homeland, comes to America. And then this is very significant because he became a citizen of the United States in, in the year 1813. <laughs> so his adopted country is once again at war with, the, with Great Britain. So he decides to become a citizen. Um, this is, we ended up going to St. Anne's in Port Richmond. Anybody know Port Richmond, section of Philadelphia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So St. Anne's beautiful church, beautiful location. They had a significant fire um, after Duffy died and, and, and the cemetery records for a long time were missing. Um, we knew that Duffy was buried in this old part of St. Anne's cemetery in Port Richmond. And we went there. You could see it was snowy outside over here. Um, and little did we know as this wild dog was chasing us through the cemetery that Duffy was actually buried right here in between that little one and this big headstone here. Uh, there it is. So, so what happened is we ended up um, um, being able to, to dedicate uh, a, a headstone for Philip Duffy. There was some question about this because Duffy, um, D Duffy never allowed the telling of the Duffy's cut story in his lifetime. Nobody transmitted the story of what happened there. Um, Duffy's, Two younger sons were called the Battling Duffy Twins. They were identical twins, and uh, they were boxers as well as Irish musicians in the Philadelphia area. Um, and they were they were tough, tough, rough and tumble guys. What happens is the year after he dies, within two years, he dies in 1871. Um, all of a sudden, there's this great interest among the Irish American railroading community in Chester County, and um, they start collecting stories. What happened here? You know, um, and they erect a monument, uh, a, a, originally a wooden monument. Today, it's a stone monument made out of uh, railroad sleepers. But um, what was fascinating from our perspective, here it is. Um, Pierre can tell you more about this than, you know, about the building of this and about the stones there. But when we found this site, it was an interesting thing because we were just looking at, at investigating the story, walking along the tracks illegally. I didn't say that. But um, and there was a man walking a dog in the development there, smoking a cigar. And we said, do you know anything about a stone railroad monument? He says, follow me. And we followed him. And boom, there it was. Um, this is um, this is, I think, for me, uh, 1932 or 33, 32. Um, and then this is its current state of preservation. Um, originally, it was a wooden fence, and it was put up with a, um, a donation from railroaders in 1873. Um, and what, do we have that photograph? Well, it's okay. Uh, there it is. There it is. That's the, the wooden fence. And it was repaired multiple times in the 19th century by the Irish Railroad and Community and by the supervisors in in um, in Paoli, the railroad supervisors 
ended up uh, helping to make sure that this was maintained. The problem is it's hard to maintain a wooden fence in the wild like this exposed to the elements. So in 1909, um, our grandfather's boss, Martin Clement, put up the, um, uh, he had the stone wall built. And what's fascinating is, um, you know, when we, when we found the site, we had no idea that this was, we, we knew the ghost story because our grandfather had told it, a family gathering, one of the ghost stories that's in the Duffy's Cut file. But the fact that that file exists broke open the whole story for us. The fact that there was a railroad record of what happened here and our grandfather preserved it. It was produced by Martin Clement uh, and, his, and his colleague, uh, George Sinickson, starting in 1909 and the documents, that's Martin Clement and that's our grandfather. Um, and this is a fascinating thing that the records, many of the, many of the items in the railroads archives and library were district were, were actually sold at auction. Um, and it's, but it's because of our grandfather's connection to Martin Clement that he ended up with the file on Duffy's cut, because we were told, um, Bill and I have been told by Clement's family, Martin Clement's family, that whenever he showed the file, my grand, our grandfather was there uh, whenever he would bring it out. So when our grandfather uh, gained possession of the file. He annotated it, redacted it. There were a couple dates that were incorrect and he added little, uh, little changes of date to things. Um, but he made sure it was preserved. And without that file, um, there's no way that we could have done what we did at Duffy's Cut. So, um, let's see, should we turn over to the... Yeah. Yeah. So... Any questions on what we, what we have so far? In this direction, Yes. So this is this is this is west of Duffy Scott. This is part of that Sugar Town curve. You can put up the sign. Let's go. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, part of the cut here. Absolutely. That you could see you could see east of Duffy's cut, east of the wall, how it was how the cut was 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 constructed. It's very interesting. Well, we we did a walk across the tracks with an Amtrak uh, track walker. Um, a couple of years ago, and uh, I was scared in all honesty because we went through the Amtrak training, you know, that, that tells you, you know, if you see the train, it's already too late and all that. So, um, you know, we had to, we had to be, we had to have that, that exam, that test uh, to be able to do this work here. Yes, yes. We were like, oh my gosh, we're walking. It's what they told us not to do. Um, but it was, it was very exciting. And that's where those, as Pierre would tell you, it's where the sleepers, the whole slew of sleepers are on the other side of the tracks, on the other side of the train over in that, that area. A whole bunch of them. This, this Tucked away in a Philadelphia uh, suburb, touched, a place uh, time has you know, forgotten. You're looking at uh, a, a stream that is pretty much as it was in the 1830s. The Brothers Bill and, and Frank Watson lead us to the site there. where they are finding oh, bones and skulls, the, remains of the, Irish railroad yeah. workers. 57 of these immigrants supposedly died of cholera at what's called Duffy's Cut back in 1832. But the Watsons and their team are digging here, convinced something more sinister was at play, a mass murder, and they're unearthing evidence of past violence. So it's like a CSI case. Absolutely, Absolutely it was CSI. This is a murder mystery from 178 years ago, and it's finally coming to the light of day. The intrigue harkens back to their childhood when these twin brothers would listen to their grandfather tell ghost stories about Duffy's cut. He worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad. But their smoking gun? A railroad file their grandfather left behind, stating that information about the 1832 deaths be kept confidential. It was enough to prod the Watsons, both historians, to investigate. But they looked for years without finding anything. The site is close to train tracks, covering a broad area. We have a general guide to work with in the old Pennsylvania Railroad file on this event. But what we needed really was the science, the hard science. Enter geophysicist Tim Bechtel. He used electric currents to map the area. This diagram shows where he picked up spots believed to be air pockets in the soil, linked to decay of remains. It really is useful anytime anybody would like to know what's under the ground without digging or drilling. It's not as good as Superman's x-ray vision, but it has the same uses. And it led the Watsons to what they are looking for now. And this summer in um, 2010, we have made two more discoveries. 
So far, bones of seven people have been recovered, including four skulls, all now in the hands of Janet Monge, a physical anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania's museum. If you look at a lot of musket shots on skulls, they're not that little ping that you can see, you know, basically from a modern uh, firearm. Besides what she believes may be bullet wounds, she's also found evidence of violence in other skulls. So certainly if they had cholera, that didn't kill them. One theory, that the new immigrants were murdered out of fear they would spread cholera. These researchers are determined to find the mass grave they say will shed light on what they call an historical injustice. Mary Snow, CNN, Malvern, Pennsylvania. So anyway, so Frank's talked about how you know, this initial uh, seed was sown uh, for us to, to have some interest in. The other half of that equation is that I got a job working at Immaculata 26 years ago, a few, you know, I don't know, what's it, two minutes uh, by car uh, from the site. And it wasn't really until after that um, that, you know, we could put an X on the map as far as where this was. There is also a, an Immaculata ghost story that is associated with this, but that's beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight. But just know that by the year 2002, we, we knew that this place was down the road. And the first steps for us uh, as historians, um, this was this is myself, that's Frank, that's Earl Shandemeyer, who was, uh, I'm, I, he was probably there when you were there, when he, he started, he was like one of the first um, history majors who was a male at Immaculata. And then here's John Atez, our late colleague, who uh, passed away, unfortunately, in 2010. But what we were determined to do was to get the state to recognize this with a historical marker, and it was a very interesting and very involved uh, process that took, uh, unfortunately, it took a petition with several thousand signatures on it to get this marker. Uh, we were told at first that we had to prove the statewide or national historical significance of the death of 57 Irish Catholics. Now, I am myself a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and I took that letter immediately to the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and they said, well, we're going to get this marker anyway. And then the Chester County Emerald Society, Irish cops in Chester County, Irish American cops, stepped in and they paid the four grand that it cost to make this marker. Now, you always have to have a, uh, a funding source, and in the beginning, we didn't have any. And so the Chester County Emerald Society paid for this. The Ancient Order of Hibernians guys signed the petition, and suddenly we got a marker. And that happened very, very quickly along with this. So the state archaeology officer, who, by the way, we met in 2020, right before coronavirus hit, like a few days before, came out to Immaculata to finally do the state file on, on what we did. They inspected our museum. We took them down to the site, and they gave us the thumbs up. And uh, that was it was kind of neat meeting Mark Schaefer. But he said in 2004 that we had the OK to undertake an archaeological dig. And as historians, we needed to put together a team that could do this with us to show us how to do it and to guide us along the way. Now, this uh, um, created a, a, a huge uh, amount of interest when it began to hit the local news. I mean, not not, not just the local news, but national news that there was an, uh, a mass grave in Malvern. And so um, in um, 2006, uh, after uh, we'd been working at Duffy's Cut for, by that time, I guess it was three years, we got our first book out, Prager Publishers, uh, now a subsidiary of ABC Clio, and Tile Films, along with the Smithsonian over here, came out with a, a book and a documentary that took that took the narrative from folklore into historical research. Mm -hmm. At that point, we were still years away from finding the skeletal remains. The second Tile Films documentary came out, by the way, in 2013. They were there the entire time of the excavation of the human remains. So it's a very, and this is available on YouTube in its entirety. There is a, a, a YouTube channel called Investigating Lost History with almost all the Duffy's Cut videos. And it stands alone also as a video um, called Death on the Railroad on YouTube. You can see it in its entirety. But, you know, the, the archival research that we did with our colleagues. Um, so the, it's, it's really the finding of the ship from the uh, parameters given in the railroad file, that was the first big leap forward for us. And this was, again, years before we found the skeletal remains. But we we knew from the Pennsylvania Railroad file approximately when the ship arrived that brought the man over. There was one single ship in that time period. It's called the John Stamp that sailed from Derry to Philadelphia from April to June of 1832 mm -hmm. that matched the time frame given in the uh, railroad file. And so that's the kind of ship that they came over on, a bark. That is the actual ad in the Londonary Sentinel for the sailing of that ship that our guys were on. And then on the right is the list of the passengers. 
And while the Pennsylvania Railroad file doesn't have any detail on the names, because we had the ship list, we're able to put faces to the anonymous victims buried at Duffy's Cut. So how old they were, their average age was 22. Their average height was 5'5". Five five. We found out from the skeletal excavations. Um, and their, their occupations that we're looking for are the laborers. Um, and most of them came from Donegal, Tyrone, and Derry, all from Ulster, a very rural part of Ireland at the time, with the exception of Belfast, where Catholics were pretty much excluded from the workforce, except in the Belfast dockyards, where they literally worked at the bottom of the economy on the bottom of the ships, and Protestants got the work at the top. And that mirrors what's going on at Duffy's Cut, where there was a Protestant crew under the uh, McCartney brothers working up top to lay the tracks and the Catholic workers under Duffy working down in the valley to do the hard labor of building the fill. Um, Phil Duffy, as Frank mentioned, was out there in the area, uh, 1830, 1832, in, a, in this house. Uh, that house has been torn down to make the McMansions, you know, condos and things. Hard to believe this happened in 2022, late last year. But this is the house he was staying in at the time of Duffy's cut with um, 27 uh, laborers, 10 of whom are listed in the census as non-naturalized alien laborers. Uh, therefore, they were recruited by agents of Duffy over an ulcer to be brought over here to work. Uh, we don't have the ad uh, for the calling of the uh, workers like we have for the ship, uh, but you know that would be a dream come true. In the course of our excavations, a couple of things here of great importance. The dairy stem pipe um, so that we've got uh, the port of departure for the ship. This we found uh, about a year after finding the uh, record of the John Stamp. Um, the uh, British called it London Dairy. The guys themselves who are Catholics called it Dairy. So um, that's still an issue if you go to Northern Ireland today. Um, but uh, this is historical context in, you know, in the situation of, of our archaeology. This was found by, the, by our late colleague, John Antez, the same day as we found um, Irish emblem uh, elements that you'll see in a moment. But most of these guys came from the very far northwest of Ireland, very rural, very agrarian, with the exception of Belfast. And these guys pretty much would have been excluded from the workforce, you know, being um, laborers on farms. They would have been doing ditch digging, um, uh, fence making, you know, and uh, things of that nature uh, at at the most. But they certainly weren't. Right up there. It's on the Foyle River, right as it approaches the ocean. And we visited that port in 2015. And uh, we're probably going to be taking a, a set of anonymous remains there uh, next year or the year after. That's being arranged. Um, this is a, a sectarian map of Ireland, you know, showing the uh, blue is Catholic, the red is Protestant. And so they came from an area that's really the fulcrum of Irish history. This is where later on, in the 20th century, the troubles occurred, of course, in the 60s, to the 90s. And with the same issues at stake, e economics, you know, the Catholics being excluded from the workforce. So Frank talked about this. Now, once it hits the, the, the Irish uh, American community, um, Duffy's Cut uh, uh, elicited a lot of different responses in art. So the David Hollenbach uh, painting over here on the cover of the Penn Gazette in November, December of uh, 2010, um, the uh, Tim Durning painting in the middle, um, you know, showing uh, more contemporary headgear than they would have had, but it's interesting. Um, the um, uh, mural on the right is at Marty McGee's, um, and um, that is uh, the uh, the stone monument with workers superimposed, workers here on the tracks. And then there is the Celtic cross with the, the dead buried at West Laurel Hill, all incorporated into this Irish and Irish American mural at Marty McGee's. Eric Octe was the artist. He came out to a, an NEH Summer Teachers Institute that we held on Duffy's Cut in 2016 and talked about the process, you know, why he included certain things in here, why Duffy's Cut and John Barry sort of dominate the scene on this side. Over here, it's Black Jack Kehoe, the Molly Maguires, and then scenes from Derry. Um, one of several novels, um, there, there have been, um, you know, I, I'd say about five different literary uh, representations of Duffy's Cut, as varied as the uh, paintings and also, oops, the music. Uh, there, I mean, they, they, we have a CD. I didn't bring any of those here, uh, but you can get it through our website. Um, uh, the biggest name in Irish music and folk music over there. Um, uh, 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 Christy Moore has done a Duffy's Cut song and then there are spinoffs from that and there's probably about 30 different songs by reputable groups including the Dropkick Murphys out of Boston contemporary Irish
rock. So, yeah, we had, we had a lot of them on our CD. Yeah. So anyway, once again, it, it hit the, the local news. Uh, Walt Hunter did a, uh, a lot of stories on this. He knew our grandfather, you know, and the, you know, sort of worm turns kind of scenario. Interesting. Now he's talking to us. He talked to our grandfather in Narberth Borough government, but a lot of support from the labor laboring uh, groups, uh, various unions, Amtrak, IBEW, and then East Whiteland Township granted permission for the dig shortly after the, uh, uh, acquisition of the state historical market. So this is the this is the ongoing work we were doing, and um, you can see the Valley Creek here that goes into under the under the culvert under the under Duffy's Cut, and it it starts out as Springs about a quarter mile south of the fill line here. Um, and this is the excavation in the old railroad fill. There's the modern line. This is where we were working, where the Philadelphia and Columbia line still existed. That's Tim Bechtel our geologist who's going to be the guy on the scene who really found the most important bits of evidence with the radar. These guys here, are the Bravo group, Battlefield Restoration Associates who came out and helped. And then we had guys from um, the Greater Philadelphia Search and Rescue whose dogs scented out a burn field of ash where we found the first evidence of uh, the Irish workers in detail. So this has been called the oldest example of Irish nationalism in North America. We're going to be working on an article about that shortly uh because we have another pipe bowl that has irish emblems on it too but this says flag of ireland it's got the erin Bra flag that's the flag that was raised in the 1798 1803 rebellion of the united irishmen you know from wolf tone up to robert emmett this was the flag the shamrocks on the other side of this is a, a, a round tower but we do have these on display in our museum we have a museum out at immaculata that's open every day that the uh, library is open and i know pierre has been there you're all welcome to come just let me know i'll give you a tour it's across the across the lawn from the office. Frank can help. So this is the area where all the artifacts were found. Um, these are condos that were put in in the year 2000. And um, in conjunction with a lot of very interesting stories from the people who lived in this cul-de-sac who saw supernatural visions. Now, folklore is all about ghosts, right? I'm just telling you, this place, if it isn't haunted, then there's a mass psychosis. Um, everybody saw something. And this is the square in detail that you see over here with the various artifacts, including the Irish emblem uh, pipes. Um, the, the work crew here in 1832 lived and worked in the valley. The later work crews lived at Garrett's Siding, which is just down the road on King Road from Immaculata. It's very close to our, our campus today. Yeah, bullets uh, found in here too. So there, the, the X's mark spots where bullets were found. There were... Um, uh, once we began excavating these remains and Janet Monge came on board, um, signs of physical violence to the men. Uh, they were uh, all victims of perimortem. Janet Monge says time of death violence. Uh, she was trained like an MD, uh, physical anthropologists are, and uh, she said she saw uh, injuries uh, similar to these injuries on these workers on the uh, remains of soldiers from Custer's last stand in the Little Bighorn. So close combat kinds of situations mm -hmm. hit over the head with axes and so on who, who owns this property this property is actually a little farther out than where tim is standing there where earl is standing uh amtrak land now that is interesting because the entire time we were there we were in terror of the homeowners the homeowners don't own this amtrak which originally was our adversary is now on our side we can't deal with the homeowners anymore but they they i'm going to tell you right now there's an easement in between uh, these properties that enable us. It's an Amtrak right of way. And I was down there just a short time ago with them and they were cleaning up the spot. Uh, the, the IBEW guys. And uh, uh, you'll see at the end here, they got another um, uh, sign up for us over the stone monument, which is more accurate even than the state one. Um, this is the uh, uh, Barlow knife that was found on one of the skeletons. Um, the idea that you, would you really leave this behind, you know, with somebody not rifle through your pockets, that's because these guys were in the in the midst of a cholera epidemic. They were messy. They were also victims of violence because the first seven we found in here would be about in here on the uh, on the map where these oops where these bodies were found, right there adjacent to these the uh, uh, burn field. That these guys were were bloody messes. There's no way that the and with no defensive wounds on them whatsoever that they weren't a bloody mess. First guy we found was this set of remains here. And this was March 20th, 2009, right after St. Patrick's Day. And um, 
it was it was uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, Tim Bechtel put a pole in the ground and said, "Dig three three and a half feet into the fill at that spot." And by God, it was X marks the spot because there was a set of remains that came out at the end of the day. This is the image that he got for us. Uh, this this set of remains was an approximately eighteen year old male. This was the first bone retrieved, uh, right here. Bob Frank was the student who brought it out, and I almost had a heart attack. Um, these were items of um, interest that were found with the skeleton. This is a pants clasp, and this I'm wearing something like that right now because my belt's too long. I mean, the end of the belt. I got <laughs> I got to use a paperclip. But anyway, TMI, whatever. The thing is that you didn't have modern buttons and stuff on pants necessarily. And this is a shoe buckle. This is down at the Penn Museum still. Uh, they wanted to keep that. Now, the bones that were saved, we, we, buried, we buried most of these guys. They're in the office now because Janet Mons retired and deaccessioned the bones. The teeth that were not buried with them that were retained for scientific study are in my office, as are several of the long bones to compare sizes. And again, their average height is 5'5". Five, five. This person was 5'2", because it was a woman. She was murdered, too. She had perimortem blows to her head. Because Tim Bechtel found us another radar image um, about five feet west of John Ruddy under a huge tulip poplar, which is this thing right here that had to be cut down uh, with um, a lot of assistance from the state. State eventually gave us a grant. We hired a guy to do this and it took Al Dawson. I don't know if you remember Al Dawson from the grounds crew at Immaculata. The guy who cut this down <laughs> left about 80 feet of tree and Al Dawson came down and zip, took the whole thing down. Done in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So it made it made quite a sensation. Uh, we have several remain bones here from the man under the tree he was entwined in the tree. This is a tall guy over six feet tall at a time when their average height was five, five. He was a victim of exceptional violence. You'll see in a moment. Uh, we had a lot of people. There's Janet Mons, there's Samantha Cox, who's still on the scene. She's the head of the DNA lab at Penn and we working with us when we're out at Northwood. There's Tim Bechtel, one of his students, uh, all my student dig crew, uh, Frank, uh, Norm Goodman, who was a deputy coroner, and then Bob Frank and Pat Barry, who had the golden shovels. Um, the Irish government has taken exceptional interest in this because they have expressed an interest in helping us rebury anyone we could identify. Of course, there would be two individuals we took over, uh, one in 2013 and one in 2015. Michael Collins, the ambassador, it's funny he's named Michael Collins because he's not the Michael Collins, you know, but um, the big guy, but he was uh, the big guy for us because he opened up the world of the Irish uh, government for us, the Republic. So ambassadors, consul generals, prime ministers, deputy prime ministers, and finally the president of Ireland himself, still in office, uh, Michael Higgins. Um, so we, we had audiences with these guys and we, we showed them the importance, you know, in Irish American history. Sinn Féin on the other side, that's... Uh, uh, Pat Doherty, who was Jerry Adams is vice president of Sinn Féin on the left. And then Linda Dillon, the uh, mid Ulster mayor, um, uh, currently uh, very active in Sinn Féin policy. They are the guys who came through with us to, to help us find graves on the other side. Um, it really was a kind of sectarian level of interest, even though the uh, consul, uh, de uh, the, the consul in uh, 2015 said, don't, don't get sectarian. Well, I got to tell you, when we took Catherine Burns over, it was nobody from the Northern Ireland government who came and everybody from Sinn Féin. <laughs> so it's, anyway, these are these are forensic details that are very interesting. So the first guy we found, the 18-year-old male, John Ruddy. He was missing his right top front. We figured he's John Ruddy. 18-year-old male. Look at the ship list. There's one guy, John Ruddy, 18 years old from Donegal. Missing his right top front molar from birth. Our forensic dentist, Matt Patterson, found that and uh, said that this is like one in 100,000. Very rare. Well, guess what? Ruddy's in, in Donegal who found out that we found this guy and he was missing his right top front molar began contacting us that it is a, a, a dental anomaly that's still prevalent in the family. You want to talk about the tall guy? Sure. Um, so this, these images of the, of the skull come from what we call SK006. He was the tall man. Um, and from what Janet Monge told us, uh, he would have been considered a giant in that era. He was over six feet. And um, when when the when the body when the, when the skeleton was in the ground, um, his jaw was hanging down like in like in the Christmas Carol when Marley's ghost comes in, you know. And and then he pull he unties his his uh, his little knot and his chin comes flying down. That's the way his chin was, but. What was most interesting is when when we removed the skull, 
this is a bullet hole. And the bullet that was in his, that he was shot, with, the pieces of it are still in his skull. And he was buried with that, uh, with the bullet in his skull. This is an ax blow. And you'll see, actually, what, what happened was our anthropologist uh, said that he was almost certainly axed by a right-handed person from behind and then shot in the top of the head to put him, put him out of his misery. And no signs of defensive wounds on any of them. So uh, undoubtedly, uh, they were tied up, she says, before they were murdered. They'd rather commit murder than um, you know, try to deal with the, the fear of the contagion. It happened along the uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the CNO Canal in instances. Also in, in other areas of Chester County, there was an enormous uh, uh, mass murder that happened shortly after this. It was reported in the newspapers of a group of immigrants and the man who housed them over fear of contagion. And their bodies were burned and the house was burned. And even the guy who was trying to help them was killed and burned. That, yeah, that's it, it's in Chester County. The precise location was not recorded, but it's in the Philadelphia Inquirer and a number of other newspapers from the time. Unparalleled barbarity. Um so in an era of brutality, this was especially uh, brutal. This is the tree that had the uh, skeletons under it. That sure as hell looks like a skull there. These are two of my dig guys, Taylor Sims and Charles uh, Markward. And that sure as heck looks like a skull. It wasn't. It was just a, an incredible coincidence. This is Al Dawson taking the tree down. This is Joe DeVoy, an Irish contractor from Wexford, who came in and popped the stump out wanting to take the tree to make Irish instruments out of it called 57 brand. It has to cure for a long time. So I don't believe the instruments have actually been made yet, but he, he got this tree stump out for us and there were human remains removed from that two weeks before the reburials of the first bunch at West Laurel Hill. And um, so we had an auxiliary Bishop. We had a representative of the Irish government and um, yeah, and uh, so there's just, you know, and Bill Doran, the guy receiving the coffin, made the coffins as well as for the return of John Ruddy uh, to Ireland. That's Bob Frank hanging, the, hang, uh, giving him the caskets. That's what you shrink down to. You know, this is the kind of crazy thing here that it's almost like a G.I. Joe box. But that's what's left. So we go, went, went to uh, the Republic of Ireland in 2013 with the remains of the individual we identified as John Ruddy. And we had to get the coroner to say that these remains were not contagious or a problem for Irish soil because um, there was this issue raised, you know, that it could have, what was there left? I mean, bacteria, I guess the virus, bacteria, whatever cholera was, the Vibrio cholera virus, it dies with the host. It's not like it can survive. But uh, that was an issue, and his body was held up in Irish customs. We shipped him over ahead of time, and his body was held up in customs for that. And it took the consul, Peter Ryan, uh, calling from uh, New York to uh, get the body out of quarantine so we could rebury him. It's kind of insane. He was buried in the uh, pl burial plot of uh, Vince Gallagher, who founded the Commodore Barry Club in uh, Philadelphia. These are all ruddies who came out to the reburial. Uh, Canon um, Austin Laverty presided. Shovelin Funeral Home provided the uh, the burial services, and that is the uh, marker for John Ruddy that is we actually have a friend over there, Joe Coleman now in our draw from the St. Andrews Society and St. He's in the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. He just visited this yesterday. Um, Were they able to do DNA in any of these sites? Yeah, so the DNA part of this thing, we we collected Ruddy DNA and we thought it was $1,000 for sample. We had enough. No, nah, it's $10,000 a sample. Now we can do DNA. We had a fundraiser a few weeks ago. Uh, Kathy Burns and Perry Livermore gave gave us a huge event at the Irish Center. But you know, I mean, you know, it's we still don't have a company that's willing to do it. It's the grinding up of the old teeth that's the expensive part. It's not like in a DNA um, a test that we all can do that might cost a hundred dollars. This is the grinding up of the old teeth and extracting it. And hopefully, I mean, we're hoping that the Penn DNA Lab uh, will be able to do it. I don't know that all DNA labs can do that, but. We're hopeful now that we can. We have some money that can go to And Brian McCall, friend of its Gallagher, um, got us a grave in Tyrone for Catherine Burns, the woman who was murdered. And um, uh, so you saw the uh, video clip of, of uh, Canon Benny Fee doing the sermon. We, he did a wake and then a funeral mass. And the people who were the pallbearers were Catherine's from the parish. Um, there's our pipe band playing. And um, there's the program, but that was very moving. I mean, it really was uh, uh, un unexpected 
Absolutely. And um, so later in 2015, Joe DeVoy's last actions with us were to get core samples. But then unfortunately, we're in the wrong spot. He wasn't there. We knew, it. We knew they were in the wrong spot. We were telling these guys, like, they cost thousands of dollars bringing these guys out. And Amtrak okayed it. Everybody okayed it. <clears throat> the um, I don't have corona. I had it weeks ago. I don't have it again. I just have allergies like hell, and I'm tired. <clears throat> but the, the they should have been um, in an arc around the stone monument, not directly in front. There was nothing there. We were telling them, can't you move this? They didn't do it. So like it. core samples, that's a big-time operation, but no no uh, results. Because um, we knew from Tim Bechtel, let me go back, that he took a radar reading showing this, it's called a stopping void where you've buried someone or something that then dissolves and collapses to the bottom and leaves an uneven layer of soil above it, kind of like a, a, a destroyer looking for a sub using sonar. And so they're, they're there. They're, they're, there's a huge number of skeletons at this particular spot. Now, this is about, I don't know, uh, 50, 60 feet away from the parts of the old fill where the other skeletons were. But um, they're there. There's nothing else these guys that can be there other than the rest of these guys. And our Tim, Tim Bechtel, our geologist, says that he thinks they were moved when they sloughed off the western end of the fill to accommodate the expansion of the fill to make um, the you know possible for larger locomotives to go over in 1870, he thinks they were moved from the western end of the valley over here. And um, anyway, we had an NEH Teachers Institute at Immaculata in July 2016. Teachers from across the country, uh, John Hankey, uh, you may you guys may know about uh, John Hankey and the BNO Railroad. Yeah, so he 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 did a special presentation at the Railroad Museum of Strasbourg. Tim Bechtel took the guys down in the valley, and Janet Monge and Samantha Cox showed the teachers how to identify, um, you know, a uh, an example of paramortem violence. And um, we all got to handle old bones, you know, that were many many centuries. Years, old, yeah, years. but you can see like a, a sword cut, the kind of injuries our guys got from pickaxes. Um, the various books, you know, various uh, kinds of books. On the cut, um, I don't know if I have the one with the music, but there's an equal, I mean, there's a vast story. This is just a small sampling uh, where where it's made, it's 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 made an impact in the narrative of Pennsylvania history, of, of railroad history, of epidemiology and folklore, because those damn ghost stories, you can't, you, I mean, you, they're there. I mean, whether you believe in it or not, it's it's there. I mean, that is the folklore is there, whether you believe in the supernatural or not. This sign well, this was the most recent uh, uh, big deal because this was put up over the uh, the uh, stone monument. And I, again, as I mentioned, I was out there like two weeks ago with Pierce Kerr and the other guys from uh, IBEW Amtrak. And um, there, there's a plan to put I, I got an email from the archaeologist. Amtrak actually has a full time archaeologist wondering w if we had maps showing where we'd excavated because they're about to put up a fence along the entire route because some guys got killed recently on the tracks. And so they wanted to know if we, you know, can give them information about where the bodies were so that they wouldn't disturb the area. Thing is that the, the, they're going to be putting up this fence very close to the tracks and in front of the stone monument. So it's not going to disturb anything. And the IBEW guys got Amtrak to agree to a, to a fence here where the stone monument is and this sign is that will not obscure the view of the sign or the stone monuments from the tracks. So that's that's in the works. But what's the one about the sign? The original sign that was there um, did did not call it Duff. Did not call the site Duffy's Cut. That the railroad, uh, the railroad called it Duffy's Cut, and it's it's in records of the railroad, Pennsylvania Railroad in particular. But um, so we wanted we wanted we wanted this called Duffy's Cut so that it would it could be seen. But also the fact that. Um, murder was involved and we know that murder was involved um that that was put out for the public's eye to see that they died not only of cholera but in particular of murder and uh, we went and we made a presentation to the um to the to the his local historical society there and they agreed to that so we have we have the community itself acknowledging that there was murder involved here but then also significantly enough um, in 20, 2011, I think it was, 2011, we had a proclamation from, from Harrisburg. The Pennsylvania um, Senate issued a proclamation acknowledging what happened at Duffy's Cut and mentioning that they died of cholera and murder. 
So originally there was a cover up and it was perpetuated by the railroad, perpetuated by politicians, by local people, because uh, when they started to rebuild the tracks after these guys were buried um, in August of 1832, um, when they advertised for workers the next spring, uh, they said it's healthy environment. You know, there's nothing to worry about coming when they hired local people to finish it. Um, but this is this is significant. The state proclamation is significant. There's official acknowledgement now that these folks were murdered. We know it from the science, but public the public narrative now includes the fact that these folks were murdered. Very significant. Hey, there's two other uh, kind of interesting things. One uh, is that in um, it was 2014. There was a call that came in the office from a guy who lived in Berwyn down the road from Immaculata who said that he knew his ancestor had been in the horse company and had done something wrong and he wanted to do something right and open up their records for us. And he said that they had an incident report because there's a descendants society of the East Whiteland horse company. Those are the guys who, whose uh, boss was living at mile 59 in 1832. His name was Jeremiah Pratt. And um, so whatever murder happened there happened in part you know, to contain the cholera epidemic, but under his auspices, you know, whether it was nativism involved and all the other probable scenarios, because they didn't have anyone to advocate for them. They were convenient uh, scapegoats for the arrival of cholera. But this guy said he wanted to open up his records and we would be able to look at this stuff and it would be great for us. I said, thank you. We'll be very appreciative if this would happen. And he said that they had an annual meeting between Thanksgiving and Christmas where they had a dinner and they were going, he was going to try to convince the leadership to allow us to get in and look at these archival documents. No word from him. January rolled around and I called the guy and I said, look, I don't know where it stands, but we'd be very appreciative if you'd allow this. And he said, they closed ranks. They were afraid of a lawsuit from collateral descendants of these guys, which is impossible, but <laughs> that's what their fear was. So that came up to nothing. Um, you know, th you know that that's an, an odd uh, scenario. That if something, you know, I mean, obviously, if we could somehow get in there and and you know, find verifying evidence, you know, from the the guy inside of the guys who perpetrated this, they thought they were doing the right thing by containing cholera. They didn't care about these guys. These are, you know, people without advocates at all. And it wasn't a Catholic church in, in this area, but, you know. Yeah, but the the other thing, yeah, go ahead, what I was going to say. <clears throat> There is one man who is connected to the uh, horse company, a local landowner who was the magistrate and uh, one time sheriff of the of the area, uh, Cromwell Pierce. And with a name like Cromwell, you'd think, oh, he's well, his. Yes. So he would have been the only one to allow a quarantine of the valley. Um, he and, and we did a little bit of research on his background and uh he had a great i think it was a great grandfather who fought in the battle of the boyne for king billy and was very proud of his orange heritage so it, there was very much i mean i'm for I'm, I'm i'd be considered a protestant you know in the north in the south whatever you know in ireland but there, but but the reality is that there was um, from the from the person in charge of the law, in charge of enforcing a quarantine in 1832 in, Ch in this part of Chester County, the man was proud. He, he, his biography says he was proud of his orange heritage. And and it's significant that that the only person who could have ordered this had a stance that would have looked down on these Irish Catholic laborers with a um, with disdain. Um, and disinterest. And the least we could say is that he looked the other way when the horse company murdered these these individuals. Well, here's the thing, too. So that I, um, there, there was in Philadelphia in 1831 an orange-green riot. You know, it was a, a Catholic uh, uh, defense against an orange parade through their neighborhood, very much like you see in Belfast and Derry every year. That happened in Philadelphia in 1831. It was adjudicated in court, and the judge said, just keep your old world problems out of Pennsylvania, please. Didn't resolve anything. But, you know, that's that's part of the background. Down the line, in the 1840s, nativism takes hold. The, the uh, Bible riots in Philadelphia, you know, there's Irish Catholics lynched in the streets, right? And uh, so there is there is this this part of this story. Again, why should Fain latched onto this is partly because of it, it mirroring situations, you know, in Ireland through the time of the Troubles. But the, uh, you know, the idea that these guys uh, had no one to uh, 
uh, uh, speak out for, on their behalf. Duffy was himself an Irish Catholic, but obviously was primarily concerned with making money, you know. And um, so, um, you know, the, you, you put that guy's call into this bigger picture, and then you realize that there are other sites like this nearby. There was another uh, thing that came in, and as far back as 2004, we couldn't act on it until just starting about two, two, two and a half years ago, out in Downingtown, a spinoff site from Duffy's Cut, where one of the men, as reported in the newspapers in 1832, is escaping the quarantine at the Cut, running west uh, to a specific spot on the map, which corresponds to mile 48 of the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. And that was Peter Connor was the contractor out there, another Irishman. This guy was probably running to relatives or friends that he knew were working at that other site. They are all reported to have died, just like at Duffy's Cut, and buried north of the track line in what is now a cemetery, but was at that time made into a potter's field. And that's where we're working right now before returning to the cut, because there are another 50 skeletons out there at the cut. We want to get those guys at the cut. But the, the time is right now for working at Northwood. And um, so that's that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Um, Peter Connor, are you going to talk about it? He was beaten sure. up by an orange from the from the court records of Peter Connor, you can um, <clears throat> because Peter Connor was beaten up. He, there was a case of assault and battery brought before the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, uh, and <clears throat> Peter Connor, who was the contractor for Mile Forty Eight, um, was beaten up by a man named Henry Gallagher, who founded what was called Gallagherville. It's now part of Downingtown. Um, and he was an orangeman. And um, the reality is, is that the jury was made up of residents of Gallagherville and Henry Gallagher got off and poor Peter Connor had to pay, pay the court expenses as well as enduring getting the poop beaten out of him, pardon my pun. Um, and so it's interesting that we just, you know, the reality well, is, is that- really, They didn't mix work crews. They I mean, didn't mix work crews. I mean, crews. if yeah, that's was true. Catholic, Connor was Catholic, they are. Yeah, especially from the area in Ireland where they came from. Yeah, especially from the area that these folks came from, particularly the ones from Donegal. And the interesting thing about Tyrone is that the spelling of Burns, um, it's it's a Scottish spelling, which is very strange. B U R N S. Um, and we had a we had a we had a, a Northern Ireland Ireland um, in Northern Ireland. There was a genealogical group um, out of the Derry area, and they helped us tremendously because they said that in 1832, the Catholic spelling of the name Burns instead of B Y R N E S, uh, B U R N S is a Catholic spelling of the name. So it's very interesting. And it's worth um, evaluation. So over on that side, there's a lot of documents that got destroyed, you know, over the years. Um, there was a huge cache of documents destroyed in the Irish Revolution, you know, and in the Civil War period. But the reality is that the uh, the Griffiths valuations is the only way on the other side you're going to find out who was who sectarian wise at the time. And so these are Catholic workers. They're coming from counties, you know, and, and uh, townlands, as they call them, you know, the R counties that are, uh, you know, the sections of the county subsections that, um, you know, uh, and, and the fact, of course, that, that they're working under Duffy. And those guys on the John Stamp who are from Derry, for example, they didn't call they didn't say they came from London Derry. They wrote and had it written in the record. They came from Derry, which is what a Catholic would say and not a Protestant. Yeah. Yeah. So there's yeah. enough, you know. The other thing is we know we know that Philip Duffy um at times um sponsored his laborers becoming citizens. We have records of that, and it's very interesting because for those um we we know for for example, like one family, the Leaper family at St. Anne's in Port Richmond, um, that he was a laborer, Thomas Leeper, I think it was, was was a laborer who worked under Duffy and he he sponsored him for citizenship. Um, he was a, uh, um, a, 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 not a nice guy in many ways, but he sometimes tried to to help uh, laborers who, who wanted their piece of the American dream. And in this particular case, you know, he sponsored a fellow member of St. Anne's Catholic Church in Port Richmond. Yeah, we heard from his great, great grandson. Yeah. And then we looked it up and lo and behold, the, the paperwork said it. But yeah, so it's it's fascinating because on the other hand, we know that Duffy had um, he had um, houses where he put indentured laborers. You could believe this. And um, and he there's kicked them out of their houses.
houses. Yeah, and he, I mean his record of him, uh, yeah. his record of him removing people from homes up in Port Richmond where they had, you know, a, a block of houses, you know, for the labor force, and yeah, they couldn't he pay. Not have had as much he wasn't a good guy. guy. No, he wasn't a good guy. Um, that's a good question, though. It's a good question. So they might not have all worked on the railroad. The indentured folks might have been, you know, um, maids or or whatever in these in the homes in the area. But it's a fascinating thing because he did expand beyond the railroad. He was he was a counselor for the um, commissioner, rather for the uh, Aromingo Canal. If you know Aromingo Avenue in Philly, he was a commissioner for what was proposed to be a, a canal through that area that would link up with a railroad and then bring uh, items uh, diverting from the regular port of Philadelphia. So he, um, you know, he, he was also the democratic um, um, uh, elector for the election of a, um, a canal commissioner. At one point, one of the elections he went out to Harrisburg was a, com you know, he was an elector for that. Um, and then when he, when he was a contractor for the city of Philadelphia, he had very lucrative contracts uh, building roadways and you know construction sites all through the city. So he died on his death certificate. He's listed as a gentleman. <laughs> so he's he came over as a, as a teenage laborer and he died a gentleman. And sad to say, a lot of it was on the backs of folks like uh, that had died at Duffy's Cut, which is so sad. We know that he put in. He claimed that he had a lot of money that was owed him for Duff, to, for the work at Duffy's Cut. Um, after his laborers died, but the simple reality is, is that he pocketed the money, you know. And so, oh yeah, oh yeah. So um, there's been been artwork that uh, the two pictures on the left, the two images on the left, come from a TV documentary called Urban Trinity. If you ever saw that, when the Pope came over, Pope Francis came to America, um, a, a beautiful documentary on the history of the Catholic Church in the Philadelphia area. And we were surprised, Bill and I were dumbfounded, really, that they actually did a whole segment on Duffy's Cut. Janet Monge was involved. She explained the forensic aspects of it, and we talked about the history of it. And this is some of the artwork. It's on display at our museum at Immaculata in the Ga Gabriel Library. And what's interesting is he painted, the artist painted these, Fred Danziger painted these in almost like a 3D fashion so that the camera would go back and forward. And, and if you ever see the documentary, I don't know if it's on, it might be on YouTube. Yes. So, and then the one on the right, um, these, these were works of art done by um, Pamela Murphy, who strangely enough was related to my, my former organist in my old church. It was really kind of weird. They're like his, his wife, is a cousin of Pam Pam Murphy, but um, th we believe that they are likely collateral relations of some of the folks who came over on the John Stamp too, which is very strange. Um, and so she came to one of our memorials, one of our annual memor memorials out at uh, West Laurel Hill Cemetery, um, where the memorial cross is and where we have uh, a number of, of remains buried there. But um, What's fascinating is, is that it's, you know, Duffy's Cut is, is portrayed in music and in art and literature, and it went way beyond a family folktale of, of, of railroad uh, ghosts to becoming this fascinating thing that we can't even keep track of. Far from the hills of Donegal, John Ruddy was killed and buried in a mass grave at the age of 18. He was among a group of workers from Derry, Tyrone and Donegal who found employment on a railroad near Philadelphia. The men had been in America for only six weeks when cholera broke out. It is believed that the 57 men were murdered by fellow railroad workers who feared that the Irish men were spreading disease. Vincent Gallagher uh, thought it would be appropriate that John Ruddy should be reinterred in his own county and he offered his grave here beside the chapel behind me. It's an interesting day and a bit, ex bit exciting as well and a bit unusual. I suppose he's going to be the oldest man ever buried in our draw at 198. Today, the research team from Immaculata University accompanied his remains to Ardara, where a grave had been provided. A crowd had gathered to pay their respects to a young man killed 181 years ago. We'll hopefully have 50 more of them to bring home by the end of the year if we can do it. So, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing if we can 
make sure that these guys get treated properly. We're hoping that we can shed some light on the incident at uh, Duffy's Cut. I mean, it's been, it's been in the dark for so many years, nobody's known anything about it. While John Ruddy's tale has come to an end, work is still ongoing in America to identify and repatriate the remains of those buried at Duffy's Cut. Enini Reshlan, RTE News in Ardera and County Donegal. So any questions you guys have, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll endeavor to answer. When you presented this, hey, 15 years ago, like, in these kind of yeah, you pointed out that, that there was there was uh, that incident when this happened. It was just their newspaper. Was it the village record? It was, yeah, the village record. So that's the. All right, so that's the October 3rd, 1832 village record, which ha was had to have been pulled at the time. Uh, it's the only issue that's missing from every archive. And the only agency that could have pulled it would have been the horse company. So I think that there's, um, I mean, you know, the, there's a smoking gun. <laughs> no, no. Well, there's the Downingtown American Republican, which has some details, but not anything you know in the same level of the inquiry, you know they covered they covered the death some of the deaths at duffy's cut saying that, that the railroad was going to put in a cholera hospital but they never they, they never did and that doctor was supposedly john m pew the uh, md and erstwhile um contractor uh who was the head of the um chester county vigilance committee a group of vigilantes um, yeah, interesting stuff. So they are charged with uh, upholding the law where there isn't a constable, and they had the legal right, you know, given to them by the local judge in the case of Duffy's Cut as Cromwell Pierce to to uh, do whatever's necessary to maintain law and order. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, they're vigilantes. <laughs> yeah. And your horse companies were all over the place in that era, um, and they could bring horse thieves and other breakers of the law to justice. That was in their charter. And, and like in the 1880s, there are histories of Chester County produced, and they talked about them, like, you know, it was a very active organization. They were, yeah, very strange. It's, it's kind of, you know, you can imagine that there's probably uh, um, equivalent scenarios in all these other instances where we've heard that there were Irish railroad or and Irish labor. There's a, you know, in Spring City, there's a canal workers mass grave in the middle of East Vincent Mennonite Cemetery. And a local historian up there pointed that out to us. Um, these, they, I think these mass graves, I mean, within, within very short distance of my office at Immaculata, we heard from uh, people who were interested in a bird sanctuary and it's Westover Park across from McDonald's. I guess that community is, uh, Berwyn, uh, St. Not St. David's, but Devon area, and there was um, there was an, an explosion there in the early 1930s. An Italian fireworks factory blew up and killed a bunch of workers, and nothing done really, you know, in, 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 of any substance to try to uh, tell their story, preserve their story. Their the forensic evidence really probably wasn't even gathered. I went there with one student, a guy named Mark Huber, and we went there uh, at the request of these local folks. And my God, there was, you could see where the crater was. You could see there were pieces, articles of clothing in the area where the crater was located and nobody ever did any damn investigating at all. You know, people who don't matter, don't get investigations done on them. The common people don't matter. You know, when I was in grad school, there was this big thing. How do you talk about the people without history? You know, this is a case where names were recovered. It's one of the few cases that we have names here for these guys. But most cases, you're never going to know. Uh, another instance, very close to Immaculata, Radnor Paper Mill House site off of 252. Um, there's a uh, Hungarian uh, group of workers making paper out of rags at a time of the diphtheria epidemic. I guess this is before World War I. It's in the early 20th century. And they all died, and they're buried God knows where on that property. The, the guys at the uh, paper mill house asked our group to go in and help them try to find, you know, where things were. And we had a guy who was able to find, like, the uh, technology side of things. This is the sluice gate. This is this and that for the, you know, for the mill. But these 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 guys are buried, and honestly, you know, on, the, on that particular historical site. And I think these – I think everywhere we go, there are – or mass casualty sites under our feet. And I think this is the reason for persistence in folklore 
uh, ghosts and stories, you know, they're told from generation to generation. And Duffy's Cut, again, is rare in that there was there were persistent ghost stories. There were uh, legends. There were stories preserved by the railroad. Uh, the Sisters of Charity who went out to try to help these guys, there's a record of their activity, but it's all sort of atomized and localized and not part of a general narrative. And so that's what we've tried to do. And uh, we do have our uh, copies of our, our uh, latest book here. Um, it's called Massacre at Duffy's Cut because Janet Monge has verified that these people were all murdered together at the same time. That constitutes a massacre, even if there's just seven that we were able to find up to this point. It's likely the rest of them made the same kind of fate, although some of them may have died of cholera. Among the others, we'll never know until we get to them. Uh, that won't show any perimortem evidence. It's only the violence, you know, that stands out. But I mean, I think the, the you know, this is it's the seamy underbelly of the Industrial Revolution in this country, you know. So these guys got ground up by this huge process. Yeah, it's great. We've got this modern economy. We've got this tremendous m mode of transportation, but there's human casualties along the way that are just not accounted for in the in the narratives. I mean, it's it's uh, time that their story is told, you know. And we were fortunate, and you know, the fact that that file survived, and I got that job, and we had this group of guys who were all as determined as we were to go out and find them. And uh, I know you guys, you're railroad aficionados, and you'd be there right beside us. Yeah. Yeah, so it definitely was not the railroad. It was not in their best interest. It wasn't in Duffy's best interest. They needed to continue to be able to recruit workers to come in. The railroad had nothing to do with this. This was the local guys in the horse company. And um, they're the only agency that could have had the authority to do it uh, because they were undercutting local labor. You know, these guys took 25 cents a day. The local guys might have wanted more than that. They were undercutting local labor and they had no one to, uh, you know, uh, um, advocate for them you know, and in their time of need. So no, the railroad had nothing to do with this. Um, the, the, rare, the state officials had nothing to do with this, but these groups in um, the case of Chester County Vigilance Committee probably operated exactly like at mile 48, like the East Whiteland Horse Company did at, at Malvern. And I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I counted up 10,000 dead among Irish laborers from the 1820s into the 1830s, everywhere from the Erie Canal to the New Orleans Canal, that there were all kinds of instances like this. This is probably the only case, though, where you're going to get names. You know, these guys are not just anonymous victims in mass graves, but they're, we can humanize them to a degree because of the uh, circumstance of the railroad file saying when they came over. And then in the National Archives, it's that John Stamp ship that brought these guys over. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, as you say, there's a sense in which, you know, the, the only folks who could have really done this, who had the authority or the power, if you will, to do this would have been the horse company. You know, they're the ones who are chartered by the state and by the county, you know, by the local municipality to be able to enforce the law, enforce quarantines, which is what we find at Duffy's Cut. I mean, it's it's pretty much in the railroad file that, you know, that when they tried to flee, they were forced back into the valley. It's an enforced quarantine. Um the only person who could have um, legally put that in place was Cromwell Pierce. So, you know, we, and we know there's an antipathy to, to Irish Catholic identity on his part. Um, it's just very strange. But, but the other thing is that's, that's, you know, our, we love the railroad and, you know, we walked on it as kids. We love it today. If the railroad had not maintained and, and built and maintained a Duffy's cut file, none of this would have happened. All those bodies would have been, still in the valley at Duffy's Cut. The fact that that, that Martin Clement wanted to remember the, what happened there, created the railroad file starting in 1909, um, he's really an unsung hero. And he's a hero, and they're not an unsung hero. He's, an, he's a hero in this because he made sure that the story was transmitted. Yes, yeah, almost it definitely. It, 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 the Lazaretto <clears throat> was where all the ships came in at this time in Delaware County and Tinicum. You had to make sure the physician went on from the city and the state to make sure that everyone was certified not to be sick. John Stamp pulled into the Lazaretto prior to its arrival in the Port of Philadelphia, and no one was sick on that ship. But the Irish in all the newspapers at the time were blamed the, the laborers, the lower rung guys, with bringing in cholera or wherever the heck they were. That's in the local newspaper here in 1832. You know, that they were described as having lived in hovels in the, in the articles, you know, and that they, they were, you know, almost barbarians you know they <laughs> these guys these guys really they they couldn't have brought it in with them 
Um, uh, yeah, it absolutely came in down Canada, New York, Philadelphia. That's the route it took. I wrote an article about that in a conference that they, it was in uh, published in the U.S. Catholic Historian back in 06 or seven or something on that. But th that is um, that is uh, you know well established. These guys didn't arrive here you know uh, in a void, but it had a certain pattern. Uh, the guy um, down at the uh, Tim uh, Dr. Barnes, David Barnes, is the guy who, did, who redid the Lazaretto and specialty is epidemiology and history. And so he did, he was one of the guys who also did a day session for the NEH with the teachers. Um, you know, that's all you know, uh, all woven together in, in the narrative. The interesting thing, too, about the cholera epidemic of 1832 is, is that um, religion was an important part of of uh, of the story and the response uh, saying that it was God's judgment and that those who were victims of it, basically, you know, you did something wrong in your life. Um, and, you know, you were victimized in, in, in multiple ways. These folks at Duffy's Cut were because they, I mean, this, this is, this is universally the case in Pennsylvania. You know, the governor wanted a, um, a day of, of uh, fasting and prayer. Um, and while that was going on, um, our poor laborers at Duffy's Cut were being murdered. So, um, foreigners were looked on as the bringers of cholera even if they arrived healthy as our folks did they were looked on as the bearers of it and thereby uh, creating ill will in the community and potentially being the sources of the deaths of locals and and it's just wrong place wrong time in many ways but religion played a role in that i have to say i've got a, it's a reality you know um religious differences were part of it um so Anyway, you, you move ahead in history and in the 1960s to the 90s, and the troubles in Northern Ireland are more casualties there than in anything other than World War II in Europe. You know, that's it. it it's, it's still part of the psyche and certain elements in uh, the various communities in Northern Ireland. We were over in 2015. Um, there was a, you know, the march, you know, with the death of the last of the mothers of the hunger strikers. The police went in, um, shots, you know, rang. I was it's still going on, you know, it's undercover. We but were lucky we this... didn't go to that burial because we were, we, somebody asked, we were going to possibly play the bagpipe at that funeral. And thank God we didn't because the, the Irish consul general would have been very unhappy with us getting embroiled in the sectarian violence. I mean, shots were fired. And if Americans were seen as part of, oh my Lord, what would have happened? Would have happened. And we're very much a mixed group. I mean, uh, um, you know, I guess I was, there were two, in 2015, there were two Catholics, three Protestants, and our group over there. So it was non-sectarian in its, in its and approach. They wanted us to go to, the one person we stayed with wanted us to go to the Protestant bars, you know, the, the, the pubs, and, and then uh, don't go to this one, but go to this one. And we said, it doesn't matter to us. We're going to go wherever we're thirsty. So we, we went to all of them, <laughs> you know. Do you identify any uh, cooking areas or latrine areas? Yes, the cooking area. Yes, we actually found um, uh, we found a cooking pot in a, in a, in a spot that would have been um, there was a little spring kind of that popped up in this part of the shanty with, with a ladle too. With a ladle, yeah. yeah, and then forks. We also found um, three pronged forks uh, that were also that were damaged by the fire that burned out the shanty. Well, after the last person died, the railroad file tells us that there was. The, the, the local um, blacksmith was charged with burning the shanty. And so we found um, in the remains of the shanty, a huge burn field that basically went the whole dimensions of the shanty. And so, but there were forks um, and one of them actually has a piece of charcoal fused to it, which is fascinating. Um, but so, yeah, it's a good. The file also refers to a, a fire that Duffy ordered the blacksmith to start to to burn the remains of the shanty. That's the reason why there's that 30 by 30 burn field. But there's some really peculiar things. Like there's a, a nail with a button that was melted onto it, you know, a glass button that melted and, and it was you know, still there. And so it's really, uh, you know, an interesting uh, place. And I don't think it's unique in all this vast industrial, you know, work that was going on in the 1820s and 1830s. He had groups of guys like this die. But what makes this unique is that we were able to identify a bunch of them. That's a historical accident. <clears throat> Very it's rare. An accident. Well, a lot of luck. I mean, there, you know, yeah. I'm sure. Something bigger than that, but, you know, I shouldn't uh, say. Any, any other questions? Yep. 
the doctor to drug test. Yeah. The anthropologist. No, was there a finding of a criminality? Oh, yes, uh, yes. Oh, okay. okay, here's the deal. So that the the uh, the thing that appeared in Mainline Life, okay, by a guy who was on our team, who was not on our team anymore because he didn't get along with the physical anthropologist and the archaeologist and the forensic dentist, he went into veer from the majority opinion and said that there wasn't any evidence of, of violence, although you've got Perry Morton blows, you've got bullets. The guy wasn't born with that bullet in his head. And he made things up uh, coming out of the mouth of our geologist who then had to refute it. And then I sent this rebuttal into the mainline life. It was, a, you know, I don't know how many years ago, that was maybe four years ago before coronavirus hit. Um, but yeah, so that's out there. That's floating on the internet and it's, it's bogus. Yeah, well, the, the, the coroner, Stephen Dichter, agreed with Janet Monge. The coroner, who was an MD, Stephen Dichter, when we found them, the the deputy coroner is an anthrop is a excuse me an uh, orthodontist, <laughs> and he was fired by Stephen Dichter in the course of uh, our work. We allowed the guy to stay on. He could not handle, I mean, sexism. He couldn't handle Janet Monge and Samantha Cox knowing more about forensics than he did. But the guy's a, an orthodontist. I mean, we got to get real here. But his his article. They had to take out the line where he he uh, put words in the mouth of our, our geologist and said that there was there wasn't iron on on the skull right so that when she, when uh, S K O O six the tall guy was hit in the head with an axe you know there was there was it was such a violent blow that there's a little bit of iron up there and there was lead and there was lead from the bullet going in so there was all of the above and. Um, Norm Goodman is his name. He he's he lied. I mean, he, he went in the, in the print lying about the forensic aspect of this. And he did. He's he, you know, he's not like Stephen Dichter, an MD. He's not like Janet Monge, a physical anthropologist who's worked on thousands of sets of remains. And so that created a, a stir when it came out. The rebuttal, you know, came out two months later in the letters section and not a retraction. Although the online version took out that line from uh, Norm quoting. Um, Tim Bechtel about the various metal pieces uh, I, I found on the skull. And that's, that's Tim's thing because he's a geologist. But yeah, so the, I mean, the, 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 uh, the DA and the coroner all agreed and they all concurred with Janet Monge that these, this was murder officially. Yeah. yeah the, the other piece is the other, the other piece is because um, of the state proclamation, you know, there's an official acknowledgement of murder there, which is, which was highly significant at the time because um, Janet Monge was still working on the remains, but the state actually officially acknowledges the murder took place there. 2011. Yeah, 2011. So anyway, but it's a good question, you know, and certainly, um, you know, from our perspective, it's, it's important to, you know, to, to tell what happened there and murder was very much part we of it. So, so it's just fascinating because we didn't expect it. We didn't expect there to be, all that uh, violence. We're going to first. We're going to uh, complete Northwood, which is um, the one that Bill had mentioned near Downingtown, and because um, we because main reason is that we're getting free ground penetrating radar work and we're getting free earth mover work, so we can get that done very like for example last Friday we were out there and and a test hole a test pit was dug and it would have taken us probably the better part of a week to get down to the depth that the earth mover did in one hour if we did it every day, if we did it every day. so we're hoping that it's going to be done you know within the, within the year two years to complete that work there and then we're going to go back to Duffy's cut we're also going to do um, uh, some DNA work on on uh, probably SK06, um, but we want to also, uh, there's a lot of interest in dairy to bury somebody in County Dairy in Ireland, because we, we have a body in Tyrone, a body in uh, Donegal, and dairy is the last piece of Irish soil that these people touched. It was where they left to go to to come to America. So every single one of the of the of the folks on the John Stamp, the last piece of Irish soil they touched was in Derry. So um, there's a great deal of interest from the folks of Derry to have a burial there. And we have we do have some remains that we could take over. We're planning that. Absolutely. That's, that's the whole point. Yes. So ideally. Yes. Yeah, so I deal like with with the Ruddy family, that was the interesting thing because they had this extremely rare dental anomaly, you know, and they stepped up to the plate. Um, 
we're more we're more interested in in the other folks who don't have any unique congenital issues or or like with with Catherine Burns, one of the only two women who work came over with the laborers. We want to look at the DNA of some of the, one of the other folks, and probably the one who was axed and shot in the head would be the um, it would create more of a public interest, let's say. Um, and he's the tall guy. Yeah. It took a lot to kill that guy. So a lot of uh, a lot of the Amtrak guys who've been working with us, the IBEW guys, identify with that guy. And um, so that's a good question because we'd love to be able to connect up with other family, you know, uh, of these people over there. Um, when we went over in 2013, I will say this: the Ruddy family um, was part of the. Uh, have you ever heard of the? Have you heard of the disappeared in Ireland? The dis the group called the disappeared. Yes. So. There was a, this is, these are folks who were killed. They were IRA members killed by the IRA because they weren't radical enough. No, no, they thought they were squealing on. Well, they thought they were squealing, yes, but they weren't loyal to the, they weren't loyal to their version of the IRA. So what happened was um, one of the victims, I think it was the last victim, was a Ruddy. And um, his, we didn't know this, but when we went over in, you know, before we went over in 2013, um, this group of the disappeared told us that they had used our model to find the mass grave at Duffy's Cut in locating six of the murdered folks of the disappeared. And so um, it's in the, actually it's in our new book, the letter from, uh, from one of the family members who was in charge of that group. And she said, you know, we're grateful. I mean, we didn't know this, but uh, George Bush's envoy to Northern Ireland had told those folks, uh, uh, the families of the disappeared about what we were doing at Duffy's Cup. We didn't have any idea, you know? So all of a sudden we got this email right before we went over in 2013, they wanted to meet us and they wanted to give us copies of their book. And it was like, oh my gosh, I think when we met with them, there were probably more tears shed that day in that uh, in that church hall than in many a year. It was very strange, but it was very moving, um, you know? And so in 20, you know, the other group was called, um, uh, that the unheard voices program um, in out of dairy, and that, this is a bunch of women who had suffered the loss of of husbands, sons, brothers, uncles in the troubles, and they were Protestants and Catholics meeting together, and they um, they all all they wanted to hear about was what happened at Duffy's Cut, and they're looking on that as a sign of hope that you can remember people, you know, after they've died, you know, you know, hundred hundred close to hundred ninety years. Uh, you know, that, that we're still trying to remember and tell their story. So it's, it's, it's bizarre how it connects with folks, but it's very moving and very meaningful for us to learn this. Very often it's after the fact. We don't, we don't even know we're being quoted sometimes. My brother and I, on Thanksgiving uh, last year, we, we were, um, I was shaving and I don't know what my brother was doing, but I looked and I said, and I saw this news flash that Duffy's cut made the, made the front page of the New York Post. It was like, what? We were quoted. We never spoke to a reporter at the New York Post. But anyway, it was kind of it was a, a, a set of Thanksgiving ghost story because it came out around Thanksgiving. The article was on, came out on Thanksgiving Day because that was the, we you know we get be at our grandfather's house and he'd be talking about that file and the ghost story. So yeah, whatever, so, I, yeah. So it was kind of cool, but you know, again, you know, but then there's beyond that though. So that the, you know the music, the art, and all this stuff. There is a movie being made in Ireland at present. Um, and uh, two of the guys who were in the uh, John Ruddy reburial interviews, uh, Pat uh, McDade and Bill Daly, Bill Daly still in the project um, as one of the executive producers, um, they're going to be big names in this thing. And it's um, it's currently in production. It'll probably be out in a year and a half, two years from now. But um, who the hell would have ever thought that? My PhD is in medieval history, time of Charlemagne and Charles Martel. And yet all of a sudden there's this stuff that nobody could have imagined. 16th century Lutheran Lutheran later Reformation period. It's like, well, here we are. We're doing, you know, Irish American railroad stuff, and it's like, oh my god. But you know, folks like you appreciate the whole railroad factors here. That they, I mean, for us, it was a it was an education. I mean, you know more than we do about the building of the railroad, but we had a crash course in some of this stuff. Like, 
it was unbelievable. And we've had a lot of folks who've helped along the way, a lot of uh, resource people like John Hankey. You know, he walked us along and show, and he pointed out. Well, he predicted know, where the first uh, bodies would be found. Yes. Well, he found the shanty and he said right over here is probably where they would be buried. That fill, of course, didn't predate the railroad. That fill was created by these guys. And um, so the people locally were saying, oh, there may be bodies from the Paley massacre. Now, that's about a quarter mile in the other direction. You know, not not here at this industrial site at the time, which is the biggest industrial endeavor in Pennsylvania. You know, it didn't exist prior to that time. Um, but, um, yeah, the locals in, in Malvern area, East Whiteland, very, very much still interested in uh, in, in facilitating our further research at the cut, uh, which we hope to complete when we're done at Northwood. Not that Northwood is like a small part of this. There's a lot of bodies out there, I'm sure. Probably an entire crew, not just 57, but maybe as many as 100 or 120. No. No, we have a portion of the names from the John Stamp. We have, there are 50, there are 57 names, but we, we can't verify that that name of that guy, that guy didn't end up, you know, not dying. We have we have enough evidence for the names that we have on the stone ledger at West Laurel Hill that those guys died. Yeah, we did. We did, um, we did uh, like a full genealogical search. Uh, I, you know, I basically kind of tracked down Philip Duffy from birth to death as an archivist. We all did. We all participated. But I used the same protocols to search the names on the John Stamp. Um, and and it's interesting because the la laborers generally all disappeared. Um, and it's it's strange because there's another there was another one. It was interesting. One of the articles, the article that came out in the Smithsonian Magazine and was that 2015 or 2014 or whatever it was. Um, we had uh, one of the readers of that article contacted us through the reporter trying to trace their family, a man named Adam Diamond who was, um, I forget what, he was not a laborer, but he was a weaver. So we were able to search and we actually found, we found him surviving and found him living at a particular address in Philly. We were able to pass that on to him. So it was kind of cool, you know, the connections we've made with people who had family on board that same ship that brought our laborers over. And, you know, what are you going to do? Who We never knew we'd be doing this. Um, question over Yes, that was uh, that was erected under Martin Clement when he was a supervisor in Paoli. He was assistant supervisor. And so he had, I think it was Jacob Stowe, who was uh, a Pennsylvania Railroad stonemason, put that together in 1909. So um, what's interesting is we have the record in the Pennsylvania Railroad file of when that was put up. But we also know that that was the same place where that wooden fence was in the 1870s. So they and, and that's in the railroad file that, that it was originally a wooden fence. We have when it was put up, who was involved in erecting that wooden fence from the Irish American Railroad yeah, guy's name community. Was Patrick Doyle put the first fence up there around 1872, the time that Philip Duffy died. Then all of a sudden, a year Patrick after, yeah, Doyle feels he's able to go and, uh, you know, uh, you know, yeah, he, he was at the time working to expand the fill to the north, uh, to accommodate larger trains, and that's why that old fill would have been sloughed away from the 1832 PNC era. And our geologist says that's when the bodies were moved from the fill in the western end of the valley. The ones that are under the stone monument were moved at that time to their current location. There was there was also, a, Doyle worked for James McCarran. Doyle was from Ireland. James McCarran was also from Ireland. McCarran was his supervisor. That's in the, the PRR file. Um, and he had Patrick Doyle make this speech and they raised enough money to put up a wooden fence. It was on, quote, a holiday. And everybody no donated 25 cents a day and they put up this fence. Um, what's fascinating about that is that we, we actually checked the land records and McCarran lived on the property that's now the Condo Association right behind where they put up the monument. So he obviously heard Aaron Glenn. Aaron Glenn. Yeah, so so we know. That's right next to so like the chain of evidence that the railroad, the railroad told, you know, was able to preserve. It's fascinating. Um, any questions from our folks on Zoom? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for, for participating. Thanks for allowing us to be with you.